Our scripture reading again is John chapter 20. We'll be reading verses 1 to 18. John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of, both of, them, were weep, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he, had, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stood, stooped to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. All right, let's pray as we <clears throat> dive into God's word this morning. And so, Father, we're uh, so grateful to be here as your people um, gather to worship you in the midst of a busy season, uh, lots of schedules changing, school starting, uh, all kinds of exciting new prospects, and uh, we're just very grateful to be able to gather together here um, to hear your word preached, and so I pray that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you make um, this text come alive for us this morning, would we hear it with fresh ears, and we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. So we are <clears throat> finishing up our series in John's Gospel this week and next, and we have arrived at the climax not only of the book of John, but the climax of the entire story of Scripture. We are here uh, together um, looking at really the heart of the Christian faith in Jesus' death and uh, resurrection. And so last week, we talked about how Jesus finished work on the cross and how that kind of love uh, that Jesus demonstrated for us is far stronger than the hate, the division, the dissension uh, that we see around us every day, that we have uh, something to point to and offer a better way forward uh, to our culture. And this week, we get to talk about the resurrection. I mean, what could be better than that in a world filled with hopelessness and cynicism and aimlessness, boredom, uh, people without uh, direction? We get to talk about the good news uh, that Jesus is alive and that he's inviting us into new life, into a new family, uh, into a new mission, and ultimately into a new creation. And so my aim for this morning's message is that we would be a church that believes that Jesus is alive, is experiencing the new life that he offers, and is engaged in his mission. And so if you are uh, taking notes or wondering where I'm going this morning, I want to talk about Jesus resurrection uh, first in the text we read this morning. I want to look at Thomas's doubt for a few moments and then finally our invitation to believe there at the end of the text in verse 30 through 31. So let's look at Jesus resurrection here um, in the text uh, that Rachel just read for us uh, this morning. 
Um, our text starts, of course, with uh, Mary Magdalene discovering uh, the empty tomb early that very first Easter morning, and it's worth uh, noting from the outset how remarkable it is that Mary gets to play the leading role um, this Easter morning. Uh, Paul Miller notes this, he said, in a world where a woman's testimony in court meant nothing, Jesus appears first to women. Uh, He never stops loving and honoring the weak and the powerless. If you were trying to prove the resurrection to a first century audience, you would never mention women as witnesses, unless, of course, it really happened that way. And so there's something remarkable going on in this first uh, Easter morning, and it starts with uh, Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb, the first witness to uh, the risen Christ. It's remarkable that she is added into this testimony. Obviously, there's no really other reason that this would have been added unless it actually happened, because as Paul Miller said, women didn't even, weren't even allowed to testify in court. And uh, beyond that, Mary Magdalene is a very unlikely character. If you've read anything in the other Gospels, Luke tells us that she was possessed by seven demons. So not exactly the most likely reliable person that you'd probably want to put in your account of the Gospels, Jesus rising from the dead, if you were looking to convince a skeptical first century audience that Jesus was in fact alive. But That's just the wonder of the way God likes to work. He wants women to be those that would deliver this very first news of Jesus' resurrection to the world. And so Mary, um, going to the tomb early, the first one there before it's even um, light out, um, runs back, of course, to tell the disciples the rather alarming news um, that they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And so... Um, We see Peter and John, uh, which we think uh, here, as we've uh, discussed throughout the Gospel of John, is that disciple that Jesus loved, the other disciple. So Peter and John are running off to the tomb. When they come to the tomb, there is no body and only two neatly folded linen burial cloths, one for the head and one for the body. And so they're presented with uh, a mystery that they have to figure out what to do with. Jesus is gone, he's no longer in the tomb, and we have in front of us these linen burial cloths laying there, um, tantalizingly, mysteriously sitting there wondering what could all of this mean. And some of the questions that would have been probably um, rushing through their mind um, that early Easter morning were this. Probably if someone wanted to steal the body, like, why would they go to the trouble of unwrapping it? That's really Quite a bit of work, right, as you're thinking about all these two very intricate unwrapping jobs that have to be done. Um, Why are the linens in two very neat piles right where the head and the body would have been, right? It's mysterious, right? If you're just a criminal and you're trying to just nab the body and run, I mean, clearly the easiest thing is just to grab the body in the grave clothes and leave. Um, Secondly, if you really wanted to do the really gruesome work of actually unwrapping the body, which would be kind of disturbing, you would probably just wrap them all up and throw them in a corner somewhere. Uh, But strangely, bizarrely, interestingly, you have these two very neatly wrapped piles of linens laying in just the exact place where Jesus' body would have lain. Probably another question rushing through the disciples' mind, when did this happen again? When was the last character in John's gospel that we met where someone walked out of a tomb and literally had to be unwrapped? Um, If you were around here back when we were at John chapter 11, we know that the tomb of Lazarus, that very thing happened, right? Lazarus came forth in his grave clothes, and they had to actually unwrap him and, uh, you know, set him free here so that he could actually start walking around again. So as all of these questions are flashing through the disciples' minds, they must be wondering, what on earth is going on here? How do we solve this mystery. And uh, it's interesting, um, John goes on to tell us that once Peter had gotten there, of course, you know, John got there first because he was a little younger, a little healthier, better shape, got to the tomb. But Peter, of course, impetuously just ran up there and went right on into the tomb, discovered the burial cloths laying there. But it says that the other disciple, this is our author here, um, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, saw and believed. And so what, what John is telling us here is that they're beginning to put this mystery together. Having seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, having seen the grave clothes, having heard Mary's testimony, um, they're beginning to try and make sense 
of what is happening here. And, and John is telling us that this disciple believed, right? Clearly, Jesus was no longer a captive to death. Verse 9 goes on to tell us, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And so they haven't quite figured it out from scripture yet, but they are confronted with a reality, an empty tomb, uh, the grave clothes laying there, no longer keeping him captive, and they have figured out clearly something astounding, something remarkable, something marvelous uh, has just happened. In hindsight, you know, um, the, the armchair theologians that we are, we might have pointed them to Psalm 16 or something and said, hey, don't you remember the scriptures that had prophesied this? Therefore, my heart is glad, this is Psalm 16, and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your holy ones see corruption. And in hindsight, we can, of course, look back, oh, of course, this is a fulfillment of scripture. But for the disciples waiting this first Easter morning, this is just an incredible mystery. They know something wonderful has just happened. Uh, John Stott uh, memorably summarizes this uh, opening scene. Um, He says, It's not hard to imagine the sight that greeted the eyes of the apostles when they reached the tomb. The stone slab that had been pushed away, the collapsed grave clothes, the shell of the head cloth and the gap between the two. No wonder they saw and believed. A glance at these grave clothes both proved the reality of what had happened and indicated the nature of the resurrection. The, linen, the strips of linen hadn't been touched or folded or manipulated by any human being. They were, dis, they were a discarded chrysalis from which the butterfly had emerged. Can you imagine the scene? Just visualize it in your mind. Put yourself in the sandals of the disciples, as it were, that first Easter morning, uh, looking at this, these grave clothes, empty now, as the risen Christ had just broken free um, from death, that he was alive, and now hope has burst onto this very first Easter morning. It's a remarkable scene. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful scene. Um, Jesus is risen. He's left his grave clothes behind, and uh, hope has emerged into the world once again. Mary, however, of course, uh, to pick up our story here in verse 11, is still weeping outside the tomb. The disciples have gone back to ponder what could this mean, where could Jesus be now that he's no longer in the tomb, but Mary stays and she continues to weep. In verse 11 we read that Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she stooped and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And uh, from that moment on, everything changed in Mary's life, right? Uh, grieving, grieving, weeping, mourning may be appropriate, right? Pre-resurrection, but now that Jesus has come back from the grave, has come back to life, and is now greeting her face to face, and with a word, uh, just the mention of her name has changed the entire course of her life and the entire course of history. It's remarkable as the story goes on. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, I'm teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. This is an interesting thing. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so we find Mary here at the tomb, um, as she was the first to discover the empty tomb, also the first to see Jesus in his new resurrection uh, body. And she finally discovers who he is, uh, finally becomes aware of the person that he is. And you could just imagine the scene here. I mean, she just grabs a hold of him as if to never let him go. And I think if I had been there at the tomb um, that first Easter Sunday, I probably would have done so. I'm not a particularly you know, huggy kind of person. But I mean, you just figure like Jesus has just come back to life and like everything changes with that moment in history. And, and I think if I were there, even maybe a non-hugging person like me, I would have been like, I'm holding on to this guy. I'm not letting him go. I don't want him ever to get away. I'm just going to stay right here with Jesus and like we're going to hang out 
because this is the coolest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. That, that's what you got to imagine there. But Jesus says something to her that's really interesting, isn't it? There in the text, he says, don't cling to me, which, you know, at first thought, you might think, man, this is, feels a little cold or harsh or, or indifferent. Like, of course she's going to cling to him. But um, what I want you to see here in our text is that this statement here actually points really to an increased intimacy um, that Jesus wants Mary, the disciples, and really all of his followers right down to the present day for all of us to see and feel. If Jesus returns to the Father, um, he's going to have an even more intimate connection with each of us through the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus can now say, he's like, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but I go to my brother, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, and to my God, and to your God. He's saying, as I return to the Father, right, I'm opening up a new level of intimacy. Um, just like Jesus called God his Father, and there's this incredible intimacy that everyone who heard him teach was wondering, how does how is he this, have this close relationship with his Father? How is Jesus so intimately connected to the Father? And Jesus is saying, look, if I go back to the Father, you're going to be welcomed in, you're going to be brought into that same level of intimacy, that same level of closeness to Jesus. Um, Tim Keller uh, sums it up this way. I thought he did a beautiful job at it. He said, here's the gist of what I think Jesus was saying. He said, Mary, can I, I can understand why you don't want to lose your, your mentor and your friend, but if you really understand what's going on, you'd realize that after I ascend, you'll have me all the time and forever. The way I am right now, Mary, there's a chance you could lose me. Someone could put you in a jail or, or I wouldn't be there. But if I ascend to the Father, you'll have me forever. If someone puts you in the deepest, darkest dungeon, I'll be right there with you. You'll have that intimacy. You'll have that fellowship. Nothing at all will ever be able to take you away from me. Isn't that amazing? Have you experienced um, that level of uh, closeness to Jesus because of the resurrection? Do you feel a sense of that, like moment by moment, day to day, in the everyday rhythms of your life, because Jesus is resurrected, because he's alive, right? We now talk to God as our Father. We have that same kind of closeness, that familial relationship, right, that I have with my wife and with my kids, right? We're, we're in this every day, all the time, doing life together, eating meals, doing laundry, uh, taking the trash out, like that kind of reality, everyday kind of intimacy that we have in our own family. It's like Jesus is saying, because he's resurrected, that's the kind of relationship he's opening up for us. Because he's alive, because he's risen, and because he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, because he's sending his spirit into each of our hearts, right? We have this intimacy and closeness with the Father. Do you feel that today? You don't have to cling to the physical Jesus. We have his presence in our hearts through the power of of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a remarkable reality because Jesus is alive. We've got him that close, that intimate, that near, that accessible, that available. And of course, Mary Magdalene is probably kind of blowing her mind at this moment because she's just like, I just want to like, you know, hold on to this guy. I mean, he's back, you know, and uh, everything changes. And yet Jesus is saying something that utterly blows your mind. Like, because I go to the Father, you're going to have an even deeper level of intimacy. I'm going to be with you wherever you go, whatever is going on, at every step of your life. And so receiving this amazing news, Mary then went and announced this uh, good news to the disciples. She's the first one to go and announce uh, the good news of the risen Christ. And so in verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Right? It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful um, message that she brings to the disciples. She's the first missionary, as it were, to give this good news of the gospel to uh, the disciples. And then later, um, that Easter evening, Jesus is going to make another appearance. Uh, and this time, he's going to make it to the disciples. So in verse 19, we pick up the story. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, which is why we are here on the first day of the week, Sunday, celebrating uh, the resurrection, because it's Resurrection Sunday. On the first day of that in the, that week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, 
Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That's pretty heavy sort of stuff, right? I mean, that's pretty interesting uh, material here. The disciples, as we have noted the last few weeks, at this point are undoubtedly confused, perplexed, um, scared. John tells us that they're, in fact, hiding behind closed doors um, out of fear of the Jews. And so um, they're in a dark place, right? Their Messiah has just died. Um, As far as they know, um, they don't really know what to do going forward. And so they've locked themselves in a room and are kind of waiting to figure out what's going on. They've just received uh, the news um, from Mary that Jesus is, in fact, uh, alive and probably don't know entirely what to make of it all. Um, But then Jesus, of course, himself appears uh, among them. You know, the locked doors don't seem to give him any difficulty in his new resurrection body. He seems to be able to uh, just uh, walk right into that room. And yet, at the other hand, he's not a ghost because he's showing them his hands and his side and uh, the scars and the bruises. So you have this incredible, remarkable risen Christ who can walk through doors and yet at the same point is as physical and real as anyone else. He's going to be eating food in the next chapter. And, uh, but he's there and he's with Uh, the disciples, and what he says when he arrives is, peace be with you. And of course, you may think that's probably a good thing to say to people, right? When you just show up from being dead, um, and you pop into a room and go, hey, I'm back, you know. I probably would have said something ridiculous like that. But, you know, he says, like, you know, peace be with you. And we go, that's probably a good thing to say to people that are probably scared out of their minds because somebody just, you know, appeared among you. That'd be kind of a crazy thing to say. But, but the word here, peace be with you, has really a deeper uh, significance. If you know anything about um, the Hebrew word shalom, right, it has rich, deep implications. And so Jesus is saying something a little bit deeper than just, hey, don't freak out. You know, I'm alive again. Uh, it's going to be all right. We're going to be good. He's saying something profound. And I, I want to give you the words of one of the commentators, Bruce Mill, because I thought he summed this up Really nicely. I know, lots of quotes this morning, but it's good. This is rich stuff. Hopefully you enjoy it here. So, so one of the commentators, Bruce Milne, says this. He says, Shalom, the familiar Hebrew greeting, is a considerably, or a considerably richer notion than mere absence of stress, which tends to be our understanding of peace today. Right? We don't want conflict or anything. In its Old Testament conflict, Shalom basically means well-being in its fullest sense. It gathers up all the blessings of the kingdom of God. Shalom is life at its best under the gracious hand of God. Jesus' use of it on that Easter morning, therefore, represented the first truly authentic bestowal of shalom in the history of the world, precisely because he had brought the kingdom of God into realization in his death and rising. Now and only now is shalom a realizable blessing. Thus his shalom on Easter evening is a compliment to it is finished on the cross for the peace of reconciliation and life from God is now imparted. Shalom is accordingly uh, the, or the supremely the Easter greeting. And so um, Jesus shows up and it's not just, hey, I'm back, but it's peace be with you. I have just finished the work that I came to do uh, to pay completely for your sins And I'm here to now not only extend forgiveness of sins to deliver you from the wrath of God, but to deliver to you all of the peace that God has for you. I'm there to deliver peace in its fullest dimension, well-being in its fullest sense. I'm there to gather up all the blessings of the kingdom of God and deliver them to you as my people. I'm there to give you life at its best under God's rule. And so um, we have to ask ourselves, um, are we settling for, for less than this kind of shalom this morning? Are we settling for all of the kind of ways in our culture that we try to, you know, ease out of all the tensions and stresses and struggles in our lives? Are we looking for peace in uh, lots of different places other than Jesus? Uh, Peace by binging on the latest, you know, you know, Netflix uh, miniseries that we can watch, you know, peace by, you know, immersing ourselves in a fantasy world somewhere, peace by uh, whatever your uh, mode of operation might be, or are we embracing and experiencing 
uh, the peace that Jesus offers here, this incredible uh, sense of, of well-being in its fullest sense because Jesus is alive, because he's resurrected, because he's back, and he wants to usher in this new life, this resurrection life to each of us. It's a challenge to us, right? Are we living into that? Are we experiencing that? Or are we settling for some shallow counterfeits to peace that our culture might offer us to uh, simply make life a little less difficult? It's remarkable as the story unfolds, Jesus not only uh, tells them he's about to deliver the peace that the world has been longing for all throughout history. He's about to bring peace to the world, reconciliation to God. He's about to start the church, this new family of God. Uh, He's about to do all of these great things. And then he's going to also invite us into the mission of God. Notice um, what he says here in verse Uh, 22 and then he said to them or and then he said uh, this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any uh, i skipped the passage i was looking for i'm looking you're looking for verse 21 jesus said to them peace be with you as the father has sent me even so i am sending you and when he said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you withhold forgiveness to any it is withheld so not only is jesus Um, delivering on this promise of bringing ultimate peace with God, um, peace with each other, peace in um, the world. But Jesus is also inviting us into his mission. It's a fairly uh, remarkable uh, thing as we're looking through this text. I mean, this should kind of amaze us as we're reading through these verses. Like, you know, we get to be part of Jesus' mission, be a part of what he was doing In the world, the only mission that we know is actually going to succeed. Um, Sorry, Lions fans. Uh, This year may be another rough one, if history is any indication of the difficulty. But we are invited into, right, a mission, right, that can't fail. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We're invited into that mission of Jesus. As the Father sent Jesus, so he is sending us into the world to be a part of this unstoppable indestructible mission that he's doing. So that's pretty amazing. Um, Jesus tells us, right, that we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this way. He breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit inside of us, God living in us. That's pretty amazing. Um, we get to tell people their sins are forgiven, like, or withhold forgiveness. Like, that's, that should be pretty amazing to think, to consider, an amazing prospect for us to think about, but also rather terrifying, right? If you think about it, right, where Jesus' mission took him, it took him to the cross, right? Uh, kind, of, kind of sobering to think, you know, we're going to be sent out, and Jesus said it's not always going to be beautiful, right? There's going to be persecution. There are going to be people that aren't going to like the message that you have to give to them. I mean, we're talking to people about heaven and hell, life and death. Like, I mean, we're offering people the prospect of forgiveness or damnation. I mean, those are weighty, like, significant, like, um, obviously, responsibilities, all because Jesus is alive. And so, as Jesus is um, giving them this charge, this commission here in John's gospel to take this good news with them out to proclaim the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' death uh, and resurrection. I just want the weight of that to land on you. Like uh, the incredible mission that we're a part of, the incredible thing that Jesus is doing in the world and uh, the incredible thing that we're swept up into. We're, we're a part of this story. It's interesting when Jesus is, as the Father has sent me, that's a, that's a perfect tense verb in the Greek. It's an ongoing mission. Jesus didn't just finish his work at the cross and then beam out and say, you guys are on your own. Jesus' mission continues and we're swept into that story. We're a part of that story, a part of what Jesus is doing as he leads the charge, as it were, from his throne in heaven Um, We are following him out into the mission field that he has for us. And and this word here about the Holy Spirit breathing on them is uh, an interesting text uh, because, of course, we know if you've read the book of Acts, right, the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost. And so it's kind of interesting. Jesus here, like, breathes on them and says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so commentators are kind of like, so which one is it? Did they get the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Did they get the Holy Spirit here, right after his resurrection? And uh, uh, most of the commentators that I've read um, looked at this text. There's a number of different uh, ways to put this all together. Look at this text really uh, as, uh, a pre- as, a, 
at a prequel is symbolizing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. If Pentecost is the great outpouring of the Spirit in the drama of Scripture, this is the dress rehearsal. So uh, Jesus is telling them the Holy Spirit is about to come. He's about to equip you to do the work you need to do in Pentecost just a few weeks later. And so everything is in place. The mission has been set. The Holy Spirit has been promised And they're given this incredible charge to go out and offer the forgiveness of sins. This is not, of course, to say that Jesus' disciples get to arbitrarily decide who gets forgiven and not forgiven. Like, hey, isn't that great? That person cut me off. Not forgiven. (laughs) They're not, they're not, they're not getting there. Nope, nope, nope. That's enough. Yeah, see, see, we don't have that kind of responsibility clearly in this text. What Jesus is saying is, as you are sent out with the mission of proclaiming what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. As people respond to that, they're going to respond in that in one of two ways, right? They're going to receive the work Jesus has done on their behalf, that it's finished, that God's love has been poured out for them on the cross, uh, that their sins aren't held against them. Like, they're going to accept that and receive the forgiveness that God has for them, forgiveness from all of their sins, everything they've done, past, present, future. That's incredibly good news, but if they reject that message, if they reject what Jesus has done on their behalf, then then there can be no forgiveness extended to them if they have not yet been reconciled to God. And so it's a weighty commission that we have been given by uh, the risen Christ. Do you you really believe that today, that you've been swept up into Jesus' mission? You're a part of what he's doing in the world. That same work that he accomplished as he rose from the dead, commissioned his disciples to go out and be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. Um, Do you see yourself as part of that on a moment-by-moment basis partnering with Jesus, right, as you get up Monday morning, as you get in your car, and as you head to your job, or you're home with the kids, or you're at school, or whatever that looks like, do you see yourself as one of these sent ones, one of these missionaries that Jesus is now using in the world? Do you really appreciate the privilege of being able to invite people to experience the forgiveness of sins? Like, that's that's amazing. Like, that's incredible. And we, as Christians, tend to go, oh, yeah, forgiveness, that's what Jesus does. That's his job and all. And, you know, you know, we lose kind of the wonder and the marvelous nature of, like, what this actually is. And so, obviously, if you're a Christian, there's much to ponder from Jesus' resurrection. It's kind of the source of our hope, identity, uh, the power that we take with us as we go forth because we're serving alongside the risen Christ. But if you're not a Christian... Um, What keeps you from believing that Jesus is alive? This is a rather important question to wrestle with because not even all of Jesus' disciples believed. And so I need to pick up the pace a little bit here and look at Thomas here. Look at Thomas Dow. This is like a whole sermon in and of itself. I've got two more sermons, at least in the works here, probably. But I'm going to try and pick up the pace here. So in verse 24, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came So the other disciple told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and the place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Uh, Can you relate to Thomas? He's, He's kind of, you know, just like, look. Look, guys, like you may all think something wonderful has happened and the tomb may be empty and, uh, you know, Jesus is alive. And, but I, I haven't seen it. I don't believe it. I'm not going down that road. I'm not going to indulge in this kind of fantasy or fanciful thinking. Um, I'm a realist, right? I'm grounded in reality. And so unless I see this thing, unless I touch it, unless I experience it for myself, I need irrefutable proof. Um, do you relate to this guy? I, th- I think he's a great guy to relate to. He could be the patron saint of postmoderns, right? You know, just the, the doubter, the skeptic, the cynic. He's kind of like, you know, I, I'm not going to believe it unless I get real irrefutable evidence and real irrefutable proof. Um, we've met Thomas a couple of different times, and his comments here do not surprise us. Back in chapter 11, uh, verse 6, he was the one that when Jesus said, let's go to Jerusalem, I was like, all right, we're going to go to Jerusalem and die with him. And so seems like a really loyal guy, but, you know, kind of a downer. He's kind of the Eeyore of the disciples. He's kind of like, yeah, if we go to Jerusalem, we're probably all going to die. And, you know, but I'm going to go with him anyways. In uh, chapter 14, when Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. He says, we have no idea what you're talking about. And so he's kind of bluntly like, look, I mean, you may have a great idea of what we're talking about, but I have no idea what you're talking about. And so he's, he's very grounded. He's a realist. He's like, 
I need to see this, touch this, feel this, like, or I'm really not. I just can't wrap my mind around it. And so uh, he's, he's a good guy to think have around when you're talking about resurrection because a lot of us resonate with that, right? We want to know. We want to see it. We want to touch it. We to feel it for ourselves. We want to just take somebody's uh, word on it. And Thomas is not exceptional. His doubts reflect, uh, in many ways, the prevailing ideas of his time. Um, and he Wright said, uh, says this, everyone in the ancient world knew that resurrection didn't happen. More, they knew it couldn't happen. They um, spoke of it in the classical world of Greece and Rome as something one might imagine, but which never actually occurred and never could occur. Um, the Jews, though, began to believe that it could. Not all of them mind. The Sadducees resolutely stuck out against it, and they weren't all exactly clear what it would mean, what it would look like, but they believed, as we, as we saw back in chapter 11, that when resurrection happened, it would have happened to all God's people all at once, perhaps even to all people everywhere, as in 5, 28 through 29, not, and this is the point, uh, to one person in the middle of time. That would be an odd, outlandish event, unimagined and unheard of. And so Thomas is not about to get his hopes up about something odd, outlandish, unimagined, and unheard of by his contemporaries. Nobody in the first century was going, yeah, of course Jesus is going to rise from the dead. That stuff just doesn't happen. There's no precedent. There's no pattern for this. Um, Nobody believed it was possible. Um, They were confronted by death every day, right? No no hospice, no nursing homes, no, no things to make death nice and clinical and palpable. No, they're experiencing death every day and very, uh, very much more than we have. Um, huge infant mortality rate, people dying all over the place. You know, they knew death when they saw it, and they knew people didn't come back for it. And so Thomas wasn't going to be like, yeah, sure, of course he rose from the dead. That's great. That's wonderful. No, Thomas, you know, like your 21st century skeptics, uh, was not exactly going in for anything less than uh, real proof, real evidence along the way. And I think that's helpful for us today, right? You know, it's, it's healthy to have some doubts in our lives. It's healthy to be able to wrestle through some of the questions and concerns we have. Sometimes church people act like you just got to believe it. And if you, for one second, hesitate on any detail, or if you find some of these realities too incredible to imagine, like you've lost your faith. But, but no, um, what Thomas shows us is, right, that that doubt's healthy, right, to work through, process those things. If you haven't really worked through your doubts, you probably don't have a very mature Christian faith. You probably haven't really thought, because the claims of the gospel are incredible, that one man in the course of human history rose from the dead and has changed the course of entire human history. Like, that's, that's astounding. That's incredible. That requires you to really think through the implications of that, to look through the evidence, to consider the claims, and and um, that's part of kind of maturity to do that. And so, um, obviously, it, that's important. And I could go through, I have a whole list of uh, different ways people have um, doubted the resurrection in various different ways and answers for all of them, at least in very short order. But I don't have time to go through them all. So if you have any questions about particular ways in which the resurrection has been doubted throughout history, I could talk to all of them because they'd be lots of fun. People have spent their entire lives, you know, researching all of the different alternatives, looking through the history, looking through the different background, and spending their lives um, really showing that the resurrection is one of the best attested historical events out there that you can find. And so, I'd love to sit down and chat with you about that if you have more questions about that. But where I need to land the plane and do it in some short order here is, uh, where does this really leave us? Um, it's interesting, in the end of this conversation, Um, with Thomas, we see that um, Jesus ends up here meeting with Thomas. In fact, meeting him right where he's at. Thomas has set the standards here. Unless I actually uh, see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers into those marks and place my hands in his side, I'll never believe. And so eight days later, his disciples were inside the room again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so it's incredible, right, this first resurrection appearance, Jesus appears to Thomas and he relieves all of his skepticism, right? He, he appears to him and says, here's the evidence, irrefutable evidence you demanded, here I am. <laughs> here's my hands, here's my side, 
uh, check it out. And Jesus says, so Jesus obviously makes himself available for inspection, examination. Here's the proof. Here's the evidence that I have, in fact, there's not only an empty tomb, but in fact, I have defeated death. And here I am in that very person. But he goes on to say, you know, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Uh, because Thomas was able to stick his hands into Jesus' nail prints to see uh, the hole in his side, um, Thomas is able to be a witness, an eyewitness, a testimony to all of us of what Jesus has, in fact, done. And so Jesus can say, blessed are those um, who have not seen and yet believed. Right? That, that's us, right? We're the ones that um, have not seen Jesus uh, literally, but we stand on the testimony of those who have come before us and have seen Jesus risen from the dead, right? There was an empty tomb. There was no body for the authorities there to uh, reveal, and there's Jesus himself alive, revealing himself uh, first to Mary, then to the disciples, and then to 500 more at different occasions. Uh, Jesus' resurrection stands as the foundation, this historical foundation to um, the Christian faith, and again, um, is the evidence that we today can stand on. Even though we haven't seen Jesus, we stand on that authority of the disciples. And the whole point of John's gospel is, of course, to bring us to this place. And so I do get, finally, to the end uh, here in verse 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so that's where John is trying to take us. This whole journey here, everything is bringing us there. You know, in John chapter 1, we read, in the beginning of the word, and word was God. And here we have Thomas saying at the end of his uh, speech here, my Lord and my God, we've seen Jesus revealed as God. We've seen him die on the cross for our sins. We've seen him say it is finished. We've seen him rise from the dead. We've seen him uh, pronounce his peace, his shalom to the world. And John's saying, now we get the opportunity to uh, figure out what we're going to do with Jesus. Will we believe in who he is, what he's done? Will we experience this uh, new and abundant life that Jesus um, offers. And so if Jesus is alive and if he's seated at the right hand of the Father, if, he's, if he is directing the advance of his kingdom, how should that change your life Monday morning? How should that change the way you approach uh, your job? How you should approach the new school year? How should that approach the way you do parenting in the day-to-day moment-by-moment realities? How can that truth of the resurrection become real for you, really touch down in your life and begin to change you, that you're not only loved with this everlasting love because of Jesus' work on the cross, uh, but that he's with you. He's present alongside of you through his spirit. He's alive and working in his church. Uh, if Jesus has sent us into the world uh, as his missionaries, how are we embracing that missionary identity. Who are the people that God has already sent you to, right? That you have an opportunity to share this good news with. Um, who has God sent your community to? If you're here at a community here at Redemption City, help working alongside, like you don't have to do it alone. We're doing it together. Uh, as a church, if you're not a Christian, what would it look like to doubt your doubts, to consider the reality that Jesus is alive and offers a new start, a new life, a new family, and a new mission and, your, and purpose for your life. I want to close here. I've got one more quote. I have many today, but hopefully this ties the whole sermon together here in terms of the implications of the resurrection at street level, right in our daily lives, right where we live, because Jesus is alive. This is how it should change everything. And so uh, I'm going to quote N.T. Wright again, uh, one of my favorite quotes by him. He says this, the message of the resurrection is that this world matters that the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing and justice and love have won. If Easter means Jesus is only raised in a spiritual sense, then it is only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world, news which warms more than our hearts precisely because it isn't just about warming hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things, and that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Jesus 
over them all. And so my heart for like our church is that we would, realizing that Jesus is alive, that he is building his church, that he's advancing his kingdom, that we would embrace that calling as missionaries, that we take the good news of the gospel out with us, that we would um, be gospel people, that would be about advancing the kingdom in all of the areas of the world where we're struggling. There's a ton of racism, right, that's been exposed in our culture, right, that we get to bring the healing of the gospel to. There's poverty, right, There's, there are refugees needing homes. There are so many different ways in which this this good news of the kingdom can come home in our lives in both those huge issues and then just in the everyday raising children, going to your job, putting one foot in front of the other, you know, finishing up school, doing all of the simple mundane tasks that God has for us, but all of that animated by the risen Christ and his spirit at work in us. So heart this morning that we would really sense that, that he's alive, that he's with us, and as we go out today, We'd go out filled with his spirit for his work in the world. Let's pray. So, Father, I thank you for Jesus and the resurrection, that I'm not just a guy standing up here talking, trying to inspire people with a really sweet talk, but instead that, that the risen Christ right now is moving and stirring in our hearts through his spirit to build his church, to advance his kingdom, and to do his work in the world, and that that is our hope, that that is where we put our trust and our faith, and uh, I pray that that reality would come home to us this morning in new ways, um, that it would give us a fresh sense of purpose and meaning and value and fresh power for uh, just the struggles of daily uh, living. I pray that we would sense the work of the Spirit in us this week as we go about all the mundane and uh, extraordinary things you're going to call us to do this week, and I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.